If you're going to be a plumber, man, be a good plumber. Because otherwise all you do is go out there and cause trouble. We don't need people to cause more trouble. We need people to solve problems. You know, and so you can be a tradesman and you can be, you can make a lot of money as a tradesperson, right? And you work with someone who knows what they're doing. They tell you what they're going to do. They tell you how much it will cost. They go and do it. It works and you pay them. Perfect. Everyone's happy. And that's what happens when you have genuine hierarchies of competence. And so you, you listen to these panderers of egalitarianism, egalitarianism and equity, and they fail to recognize completely that there are differences in rank between people. It's not such a terrible thing, man. Maybe you wouldn't be a great lawyer. Like, it's certainly possible. Most people aren't. But that doesn't mean there isn't something you could be great at. There's lots of hierarchies to attempt to climb, and if you fail in one, go try in another. But the point is, you're still trying to aim for the top, flap about uselessly and whine about your life. It's not helpful. It'll just make you miserable. You're not reliable to anyone. You can't help out in a crisis. It's like, so you tell young people, and this is another message for conservatives, like, I don't care what you're going to do, but go out there and make something of yourself for God's sake. Be an honest person and work and get to the top of whatever it is that you want to get to the top of. And stand up for yourself like a respectable human being and be a bit of a light on the world instead of a blight, you know? And you can tell young people that and they haven't been told that by anyone now. And so the young men are so hungry for that that it's, it's painful to watch. They're so relieved when fi someone finally comes up and says, hey, you know, you, you get your act together a bit, discipline yourself, see if you can learn to tell the truth, concentrate on something for a year or two, you could be a world beater. They think, really? that's possible wow that would be that would be interesting that might make life or life worth living it's like yeah it might so why don't you go do it that's what the damn universities were supposed to be teaching people and they've forgotten that i went to harvard a month ago month and a half I used to teach there and i talked to a bunch of students you know and i told them it's not easy to get into harvard you know like you're a valedictorian if you're at harvard and not only are you a valedictorian, you're way better than most people at at least two other things, or you don't get in. And so, like, it's, I don't know what the acceptance rate is, like 5%, and believe me, not everybody applies, so it's a very selective school. And so why am I saying that? It's like, these are high-quality kids. So I told them what I just told you. It's like, here you are at Harvard. It's like, get yourself educated, man. Read some books, learn to talk, learn to think. Make yourself into something. Make the world that put you here happy that you were put there in that great institution. You know, they're out of the game. So zero is a weird number, because when you hit zero, you're out of the game. So then if you keep playing, people start to stack up at zero, right? What happens at the end of the game? One person has all the property and all the money, and everyone else has none. That, that's what happens if you play an iterated trading game to its final conclusion. In some sense, everything you do is an investment. I mean, some of it's quantified in monetary terms, but you're always investing in one manner or another. And so I think if your character has been disrupted by your persistent attempts to deceive yourself about the nature of reality, you're going to be a financial train wreck. And I mean, I've certainly seen that in my clinical practice. I've seen people burn through amounts of money that you wouldn't think someone could burn through in that short a period of time because of self-deceptive blindness. If you have a high IQ and you're conscientious, which is another trait, then you're more likely to be financially successful, say, by the time you're in middle age. And so that looks like two temperamental traits whose presence enables you to beat randomness over time. Those traits work very well in this society at this time, but you can also argue that that's also a matter of chance, because there wouldn't be unconscientious people if at some point in the past unconscientiousness hadn't aided their survival. So what constitutes beating a system depends on the parameters that you put around the system. And you can think the same thing about, well, look at how successful he is. Okay, you mean financial, all right. So then, well, how's his health? How's his marriage? How are his relationships with his children? What price did he pay for his wealth? As you add dimensions of evaluation, whether that particular person won or lost might not be so self-evident. Well, they gamble partly because it's fun. And I mean that technically. Most of the neurochemicals that your brain produces that are associated with the kind of pleasure that people really like are produced by risky behavior that has the potential for high return. We like that sort of thing. And people are wired so that they're more responsive to the probability of something good happening than even to the good thing. 
So for example, we know that if people win the lottery, a year later they're about the same as they were. Actually winning all that money has a limited long-term impact on their happiness. That's probably more determined by their trait temperament. But the lead up to the good event, that's the exciting part. It, like gambling will produce that, especially for some people, because some people are really susceptible to that kind of reward. Everyone's susceptible to it to some degree, and that can be manipulated, and that's what slot machines do. Like slot machines manipulate the human propensity to engage in a certain kind of gambling behavior. And why do people gamble? Sometimes taking a risk really pays off. And not taking a risk is also a risk. So there's no way out of risk. Gamble one way or another, like a lottery ticket winner. But what are they paying for? They're paying for the fun that's associated with the anticipation of the reward. And the brain, well, your, your emotional brain, isn't that great at calculating mathematical probabilities. And so it sort of says, you have some chance of winning $50 million. Well, it might be one in 380 million, but your anticipation system isn't a mathematical system. It just says, well, you have some chance. That's a lot more than none. Well, in some ways, it's infinitely more than none, because at zero, you have no chance. With one ticket, you have some chance. So that gets the old excitement going. You can say a life without risk is hardly worth having. It might be secure, although it isn't, because as I said, not taking a risk also constitutes a risk. When you look back, people often are more upset about the things they didn't do, the chances they didn't take, than the failures that they encounter. Now, not always, obviously, it depends on the failure. But you can sit at home encased in styrofoam and have your meals delivered. You're not going to get mugged, probably. But what's a hell of a life? Men are more aggressive. Men have more testosterone than women. And men are more aggressive than women. And along with that aggression comes a greater propensity to take risks. The best example of that, really the best example is, and the best proof of it, is the fact that there are way more male criminals than female criminals. Way more. And usually if you get a female criminal, she's tangled up with some guy that dragged her along. Not always, obviously, but it's like 10 to 1. So, yeah, men take more risks. There are more great successes among men and more catastrophic failures. And that's the case in most of the sexually active animal kingdom. Men are relatively more expendable. So here's an example. More than twice as many of your ancestors are female than male. Because on average, almost every woman has one child. Whereas many men have none, and some have like really a lot. I think they estimate that Genghis Khan's genes are present in something like 30% of the Asian population. There's massive mating success differential among men. And that also inclines them to take risks because you can be fantastically successful genetically as a male, although you can fail absolutely. Whereas with a, a woman can be moderately successful.